women, we have to work smarter, not harder. We have to begin to delegate things. Like what I'm suggesting is not going to work like men. What I'm suggesting is learning how to delegate. Learning that no is a complete whole sentence. It's dark because of sin. And it's light and beautiful and bright as the sun. The salt of the earth, fire burning and water dripping. How could they be using goddess of magic? She is timeless. The blood that doesn't need a blood. She is the wildest woman. And let me say it again for those who need to hear it. The black woman is God. Let me say it again. The black woman is God. Listen up. Hey yo, hey yo, hey yo. I am your girl, Debbie and Nikki, the original wireless woman, and welcome back to my spot, room 303. If you are new, welcome to my crew, but my returnees, you know what we do. If you like this video, well then like this video let the comments reveal how you really feel and if you're feeling a vibe we'll go ahead on and subscribe but before you blink share this link welcome welcome to all of my dial up and 5g wi-fi's this is the 40 year old version how to sleep standing up episode of the wireless woman where i will indeed teach you how to sleep standing up. But before we do that, you already know just what time it is. It is time to call the roll. So I need all of my narcoleptic Nathans and Nadines to the front of the class. It is time to read aloud. I haven't done a video in a couple of weeks as people who have been following me on my social media know I was having issues with anxiety and like I always have a pre-recorded reason why I'm coming on here to talk to y'all so like I don't always delve into like what's going on right at that moment in that time even though I probably should because I'm not gonna lie my life be lit sometimes like i repotted some of my plants today and found out one of them was poisonous and cut my hand all open on it but anyway I digress so it's been a little bit difficult to get back in and get in front of this damn microphone and camera not just because of the anxiety but also because of my schedule I'm working a job and a half and I gotta be honest my half a job it's a whole nother job and my kids my youngest son got COVID, so it's just been a lot, but I do want to make sure that I'm getting in front of this camera and bringing you something that, as I always say, <laughs> is worth your time and mine. I mean, my time pretty expensive. It's pretty valuable. I got bills and people that's waiting on me to manifest. <laughs> riches so I do not come over here for cheap or for free and I don't I don't look at your time as being cheap or free I know you make time to come and see me and for that reason I do my best to make it worth your while worth your time <laughs> so I really hope that you enjoy the content that I'm going to bring to you today as you're heading on into this episode, go ahead and do me a favor and like this video. Why? Because when you like it, well, 
I love it. Today we are going to be talking about the 40 year old version and how to sleep standing up. I already know you're intrigued, aren't you? You want to know <laughs> just what do I have up this sleeve of mine? Well, <laughs> you'll have to wait on these announcements and comments that I have to make. Well, I have a microphone and you don't. So you will listen to every damn word I have to say! Make sure that you are checking out my description box. I do have links to information that I'm talking about in the episode down in the description box. There are also ways for you to support my channel to have a fiduciary responsibility to me, should you so desire to. And there is also information about the actual episode itself. So make sure to check out my description box and leave me some comments, people. Like, comment, subscribe, and share. You know the drill. You know the tip drill. You know what we do this for. I am just here to make sure that I don't get fined. I'm here so I won't get fined. I'm going to be texting y'all. Texting y'all. Give me something in exchange for my good heart on time spent here with you. So, like, comment, share, subscribe. Send me emails at my email address, admin at the wirelesswoman.com. Admin at the wirelesswoman.com. Also, follow me on my other social media because, listen, I'll be over there wilding, especially on Facebook. <laughs> I need to get all that wild style over on TikTok because, like, that's where everybody is. But my point is, I'm working on it. I need you to come and follow me <laughs> on my social media. All right, so today we're going on a little bit different of a journey than what we ordinarily talk about. Um, I'm going to be pulling a passage from the Bible. It is Matthew 25, 1 through 13, the parable of the virgins. And, and these virgins are also called bridesmaids in some translations, so... Don't worry, you don't have to feel bad if your virginal virginity has been compromised. One thing that is a huge proponent of why I started this particular YouTube channel, you know, why I'm using my voice, my message to reach the masses is because there is a kingdom you know, a kingdom that's forming, a worldwide kingdom. And, you know, the internet and all these things have allowed us to be able to bring together large groups of people over vastly different areas of the world in order to be part of communities. Like, this is a huge kingdom building time. The thing is, we have to decide what type of kingdom we want to build. And the Bible says that the kingdom of God will consist of every nation, every people, every tongue. A lot of us think that we have cornered the market on being God's people, but God, all other sorts of influencers are going to bring his followers from all different walks of life, you know, and we have to begin to become more inclusive and accepting of different viewpoints and realize that people are not going to be shedding their thoughts and their ways of doing life, even in the kingdom. Otherwise, he wouldn't say every nation if people were going to lose their nationality. He wouldn't say every tongue if people were going to lose their language. So there's a certain mentality that we have about the kingdom of God that isn't really being reflected <laughs> in God's caricature of what his kingdom consists of. So this particular passage deals with a picture of what the kingdom will be. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, it exists on earth. That's why you pray. Let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. The earth and the heavens are not going to pass away. They're going to become one in the city of Zion. And I talk a lot about the matrix, but the matrix is an evangelical Christian 
piece that was originally written by a black woman. I'm going to need y'all to really start accepting that these <laughs> black women something else, okay? To me, the original God or goddess was a woman. You know, if we are truly made in the image of a creator, a woman, and a black woman in particular, was the first to be here. Like, for real. The city of Zion is a real place. You know, it's a place where God is going to come down and dwell with his people where the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth will meet and intersect in one place where we have these different planes now, three dimensional planes, four dimensional, the fifth dimensional plane. And the fifth dimensional plane is a real place. It's a spiritual place. It's a place you can have access to now. If you know and understand how to access it, you can travel through time. You can travel you can travel to different nations. John did it. John was on the island of Patmos. He was translated. Ezekiel did it. Elijah did it. Enoch did it. You know, you can cross into these planes and there is a biblical reference for that. It's not like I'm making it up. It's not like I invented this stuff. Like just actually read the Bible and you will start to become so fascinated with it. It's like a sci-fi novel, like the Bible is lit. It's the best anime ever. Like you just don't think of it that way. So we are going to be reading from Matthew 25, starting at verse 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins. Or like I said, bridesmaids, don't get triggered. Don't get triggered. Some of us have been deflowered. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise, half and half. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. Just totally unprepared. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps, just in case. Okay. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out. Here comes the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. Go get it yourself. Get it out the mud. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. I mean, you can stop right there because that's the message. But 11 says later, the others came also. Hmm. They was tardy for the party. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. I mean, Jesus be cold switching on folks. I mean, just code switching therefore keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour now why i picked this particular parable one i love parables i just really do proverbs and parables you know they really are the wisdom to live your life by they're timeless and they really do save your foot from slipping if you ponder on them meditate on them if you let them go down into your heart and apply them to your life. This generation is really missing so much wisdom. They have tons of knowledge. And the Bible says, you know, get knowledge, but in all you're getting, also get understanding or wisdom, the way to apply it. There's nothing that makes people more dangerous than having knowledge with no application, with no wisdom. In this particular passage, I want to pull out a couple of things that I think is wisdom for living for women, um, especially in this day and time, because we are in a dark time. We are in a midnight time. So these women were preparing to meet their bridegroom. And <laughs> like, I don't know, this weird joke about polygamy came into my mind in that moment, but I'm going to keep this one to myself and Stay on task, stay on track, but I'm going to keep that one to myself and stay on track. Okay. I'm not going to chase that rabbit today, but, um, so you had 10 all together, but you had five that were identified in the beginning as being wiser than the other five. And I think we're also in a place as well as women where we are dealing 
with a very, very extremely large group of women who are so misguided. I mean, they make it bad for everybody. But if you look at it as five and five and you can actually say, well, at least half of these maidens kind of had the right idea. Let's, let's go with this concept. So the one thing that I always encourage women in is rest. You know, these women were waiting in expectation. You don't see anybody working here. Now, there was a preparation that needed to be made. OK, they at some point had to go out and buy the oil. They had to come up with the money for the oil to buy the oil, then actually go and buy the oil. They had to know how much oil they would need because the Bible states that the bridegroom was long in coming. So the wait was longer than anticipated. So the ones that were considered wise were the ones who had prepared for that. Listen, women, this wait <laughs> on these husbands that we want. It might, it might be, it might be a minute. It might be longer than we had thought <laughs> that it would be. And the oil in the lamp, you know, um, men can't be anointed as king without oil. Oil represents the pressing, the sacrifice. Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane and Gethsemane means olive press. It's the place where they press olives into oil. And it was the place where he accepted his assignment to be pressed and crucified for the people. So Gethsemane, the olive press, that that place where you've been stretched beyond what you believe you can bear is where your oil comes from. OK, so these virgins, these maidens had amassed enough oil. It was their struggle. It was their sacrifices that they had made that provided them to have enough oil to wait. And that in and of itself is a message, honestly, because a lot of times that oil is a product of your hope and it's your hope that runs out. You know, every time we see women associated with oil in the Bible, like the widow whose sons were about to be taken into slavery because she had debts that her husband hadn't paid. She came to the prophet. Was it Elijah? It had to have been Elisha because Elisha, the one that was about that life. So I'm going to go with Elisha. So she goes with, she goes to the prophet Elisha and like, I'm pretty good on my Bible game. So when I think about the miracles that Elijah did, Oh, Elijah does have one too. Okay, let me go back to that. So Elisha tells the woman, he says, what do you have in your house? And she says, I have a little bit of oil. And he tells her to go and borrow all these jars from her neighbors and then to fill those jars with oil. And the Bible says that the oil continued to pour until it ran out of vessels to pour into until the jars ran out. The jars ran out before the oil did. And then there was also a woman, a widow woman that Elijah encountered during the drought. You got Elijah and then Elisha. And she said, I've just got a little bit of meal and a little bit of oil. I'm going home to cook my last meal and die. And he says, hey, if you can make me one little cake first, your oil and your meal is not going to run out. So it's that hope, you know, and when people are endowed with that hope and that belief, that belief that God is going to deliver them. That's what's filling those vessels. You know, that woman pouring out that oil into those vessels, that woman making a cake when it would have been her last cake are all representative of people serving other people out of faith in times of famine. And it bred belief. It bred more faith in them. And because their faith didn't run out, neither did the oil. So you got these 10 virgins and some have some oil. They all had oil, but some had prepared for a wait and some had not. So for the women who have not prepared for this wait, I know that oil feels thin. But there's also a lesson in it, too, because a lot of times we will give of people our faith. We'll put faith in people and share our faith in them with them when they haven't even when they haven't even put themselves in a position to grow their faith, to have faith in themselves. And you have to be careful of those oil drainers, those people that are just there to get your oil, but they haven't put in the same struggle. They haven't 
put in the same faith work that you have to be able in the day and in the time of waiting to have that oil in their jar. And for some odd reason, like I know men are getting mad at me for coming for them. But as I've always said, this channel is geared towards black women. And by gearing my channel towards black women, I can only potentially reach about 6% of the American population. Like it's really shooting yourself in the foot when you go against being mainstream, talking about gossip and current events and all these different things to actually cater to one population of people, especially one as small as black women. But we are the most powerfully influential people in this country. If there was anyone to target, because like I said, if you've seen my single black female head of household edition, we run this. If I was going to talk to the head, it would be black women. So we may be few, but we are mighty. I have never seen a time where there are so many men who are so unprepared for drought and for famine. You know, the days of our Josephs and our Elijahs are just over. You know, it's, it's not a cup runneth over. It's a cup runneth empty. And at this point, we have to really, really be prepared for the wait. We have time now to prepare. Like Joseph, he was sent ahead of his brothers to ward off the famine. And it's coming to our people. I mean, our, our men are out here acting like, I don't know. I, I don't know what comes next for us if if we're going to put our faith in them if we're going to give them our oil to go run off with it and not be good stewards of it because what you have to realize when it comes to other people men women children your own children if they wanted what you have been preparing for they would have prepared for it themselves they had the benefit of watching you get ready and watching you prepare they could have followed your ways that's what jesus said to the rich young ruler he said sell what you have and follow me embrace my ways my way of life and he wanted things instead of character he wanted things instead of a lifestyle so we have to be careful of the people that have spent their preparation time running around doing other stuff that are going to come to us in that day, in that judgment day, in that time and say, share yours with me. Like we got to start to prepare ourselves for that. Just over the past couple of days, I have had so many men that are trying to date me, you know, so many toxic friendships that I've had to just be like, no. Friends that are like, well, I can't be calling you all the time. I got stuff to do. Okay. Like these are not the people that cut the wheat with you, <laughs> little red hen. But they're going to be the people that show up to get a slice. They wouldn't even help you slice the loaf after it came out of the oven. But yet they want a piece. They didn't want to pick no wheat. They didn't want to harvest no wheat. They didn't want to separate wheat. They didn't want to grind it down in the meal. They didn't want to bake. They didn't want to cook. They didn't want to do nothing. But they're going to show up and want a slice of that bread. They're going to want you to break bread with them. They're going to want you to be Jesus and manifest bread with, with them. But they don't understand that it's your process that allowed you to fill your own cup. It's the people that were walking with Jesus that got fed. If they weren't out there listening to him, if they weren't following him all throughout that day, they wouldn't have gotten bread at the end of the day. You know, you got some people that's just going to show up and you have to really be careful of oil drainers. That's another lesson that we can get out of this particular parable. But what we all came here for is for me to teach you how to sleep standing up. So that is the posture we have to be in. These women were at rest waiting on the bridegroom. They weren't out trying to chase him down, find him. As a matter of fact, the women that went out to do work while they were waiting on him got left out. So this passage in Nehemiah 4 and 17 is what we have to, it's, it's what we have to practice learning how to do. When our enemies heard, this is 15, I'm starting at 15. When our enemies heard that we were afraid of their scheme and that God had frustrated it, each of us returned to his own work on the wall. This is when they're rebuilding the walls to Jerusalem. They want to um, 
they have been in Babylonian captivity and they're coming back to Jerusalem. They're being allowed by the king and he had allowed them to be able to return to their homelands and to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. But of course, you don't want to put anything valuable up until you've secured it. So they got to rebuild the city walls before they start trying to actually rebuild the temple itself. So you start with protection first and then worship second. So 4 and 16 says, and from that day on, so they've been rebuilding and people are coming and tearing back down what they're building up. So now they're having to change their whole plan up. Like, you know what that's like. You know what it's like when you're at a place in your life where you're doing good and you're building. And it seemed like every day a new weed pop up, a new problem pop up. I had to put out two fires today and my son got COVID this weekend. And I was like, where is all this coming from? As soon as you put down one rebellion, here come another one and another one. And another one, you'd be like the DJ Khaled of enemy attack. So this is exactly where these people were. And it says in 16, and from that day on, half of my servants did the work while the other half held spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers stationed themselves behind all the people of Judah who were rebuilding the walls. The laborers who carried materials worked with one hand and held a weapon in the other the sword and the shield, the same things that I was telling you guys about where your feminine energy should be. It's kind of being reinforced in this particular parable. And remember everything I'm saying is building on the other things that I want to say. We are actually going somewhere. I promise eventually one day we will be there, but everything that I'm saying, it filters back to one of these videos that has laid the foundation for it. You have to learn how to work and worship. You have to learn how to prepare and stay in a place of rest, hope, expectancy, faith. Faith is the only way to please God. It's not a product of your works that put you into a pleasing posture towards God. However, your faith without works is dead. To say that you believe in God and then watch your neighbor perish is the very antithesis of faith. You can give to someone else and help someone else because you know that God has seen to it, that he's your Jehovah Jireh, which doesn't actually mean that he provides. It means that he's seen to it. He has prepared something. We, as the 14-year-old versions uh, which the 40 year old version is actually a really great Netflix movie about a woman that has come to her 40 year old life and didn't accomplish all the things that she thought she would. And now she's having to kind of get prepared for her second act. You know, um, it's a little early for a second act, but you know what I mean? It's a preparation thing where you're saying, Hey, these 40 years didn't get me where I wanted to go. I can keep doing the same thing or I can make a change and really, really follow the the path of most resistance, you know, because like I told you, it's that struggle, it's that sacrifice that produces the oil that you will need in order to stay in the weight, in order to be prepared when the time comes and what's coming, not judgment, not horrible things, not terrible things, the kingdom, the bridegroom, the fruition of the things that you hoped for, the fulfillment of the things that you pray for, good things are coming, but it won't feel like that if you're not prepared. So this is a side note. I actually got into a big, huge riff with my daughter because she was talking about how she had so much pressure on her. I just got so much pressure on me. You just don't understand it. I told her, I said, there's no way to take any more pressure off of you than what you have right now. And I started to list a long, absorbent list of all of her blessings. And I said, the reason why you feel like there's pressure on you is because you wait to the last minute to do stuff. It's because you're lazy. It's because you want to lay back and rest when it's time to work. So that then when it's time to rest, you can't rest because you got to go to work. And it's basically the same exact parable. There's a lot of us that have grown tired and weary in the wait. And the truth of the matter is you're so exhausted that when it's time to do work, you can't even do it. And most of the time when you want to rest, you can't even rest. 
you can't really rest because you know there's a lot of things that are undone. You got a lot of stress on you and you can feel it. It's laying in the bed with you, keeping you up at night. The things that you should have done during the day, but you didn't get done. Now you're in a scramble the next day to try to get all of those things done. Women, we have to work smarter, not harder. We have to begin to delegate things like what I'm suggesting is not going to work like men. What I'm suggesting is learning how to delegate, learning that no is a complete whole sentence that doesn't need any more explanation. Like I was literally in an argument today with a man that that doesn't pay my bills or do anything. Even the energy that I expended trying to make my point known to someone that was committed to misunderstanding me was point less. Sometimes you got to block them. Sometimes you got to cut them off. Sometimes you got to let it go. It's just like when Jonah was on the boat trying to get away from God's assignment for his life. When the ship started to be tossed at sea, the first thing that the seamen did were the seamen. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a, I'm a lame. Y'all, y'all would hate to be inside my mind and see how many mice are running around and how many cobwebs are up there. It is tragic inside my mind. In my mind. Like it's random as hell. That's how my mind works. Like, oh, anxiety. Anyway. They, they were adrift on the sea and they started throwing off cargo, throwing off things, throwing off the things of value because they were trying to save a life. And some of us have thrown away our callings, our gifts, the things that are important to us, trying to save relationships with people, trying to save face with people, trying to prove points and arguments. Let that shit go. In the words of the great Buddha, let that shit go go. You can't take none of this stuff with you anyway. You might have to let the car go. You might have to change your opinion about what type of lifestyle you want to live. You might have to let the hair weave and the nails go. Like whatever it is that can put you in a better place of perpetual rest. Because the things that you want to attract to you, they're not the sum of of how you're living your life. The kingdom is not that. The Bible says that all the time. The kingdom is not clothes and food. And and, and it's not that. Y'all know I have to be looking this stuff up. The Bible literally says in Romans 14 and 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. But righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the New International Version. Y'all know me. I like I like King James. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Adam came as a spirit man. A spirit man. People get confused when they watch the creation story because it says that God formed the man from the earth and he breathed into him and he made him a living, breathing soul. You know, he made him a a living creature after he fashioned him from the dirt and the mud. But keep reading, right? Because here's the thing. You got this man and this woman and they're walking around in the garden naked, naked and unashamed, right? Right. It it was very specific to denote that they were naked. They were unashamed. They were at rest. They were at peace with themselves. They had no insecurity. Right. But then all of a sudden, here comes the serpent. Serpent says some stuff. Eve, Adam, Eve, whoever it is. Like, I know everybody's like, the woman ate it first. And it's all her fault. Like, "Mm." but when you keep reading the Bible and you get to the end, it says that the woman was deceived, but the man was not. You know, then you begin to understand that they manifested their collective desire. The only reason why Adam was not deceived about Eve eating the fruit is because he was watching her eat it to see if she would die first. So he ate it with a totally different awareness than she did. She was like, I don't know what's going to happen. He knew exactly what would happen. He watched what that fruit turned her into and he wanted that also. He had his own separate free will. So... That's another discussion for another day, but I digress. So then it says, let me just find it because I'm the best at paraphrasing the Bible, but I I really know what it is because I read it. 
But then, you know, like it's a story for me. It's like a running story. So I don't really just get into like the scriptures. But anyway, um, but then we get into Genesis three where there's the fall of man. All of a sudden now there's all this awareness that they're naked. They like, listen, God, we hide from you because, you know, like we naked. We didn't want you to. Here comes shame. Here comes nakedness. Why were they never naked before? Why were they never naked before? And the first thing that happens to them. So this is Genesis three and seven. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked. So something appeared that wasn't there before. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So something happened to those bodies that made them need to cover them up when they hadn't needed a covering, hadn't even been aware of the need for a covering before. So you got to ask yourself the question, what were their bodies made of before that? And what did the fall create for them? So you keep reading in three and it says, you know, Adam started doing what Adams do. And he blaming folks, blame shifting like, like a narcissist. And God says, you know, he started handing out curses and, you know, he give us a period and a bunch of other stuff and they doing their thing. Okay, so then you come down to 3 and 20, and it says Adam named his wife Eve, because up until the end, she didn't even actually have a name. They're both, they were both called by one name because they were one life and one being, and nothing would have separated them from each other except death, and now death is entered in, so now you need a separate name from me because I can continue on after you're gone, or you can continue on after I'm gone. So his name was Adam, her name was Eve, and he named her like he named all the other animals because he was what? responsible for her. Let's move on. So the Bible says in 20, um, he gave her a name after a purpose. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all living. Then here comes 21, which is pretty dope. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. <sighs> That's just your daily Bible reading. But at the point it says God sewed together and made garments of skin for them. Like I've always thought that to be like some type of loincloth, like, you know, like he killed some animals, used the animal skins to make clothes, but interpretation is everything. What if he put skin on them? Like what if they had like sinewy bodies, like some type of like lawnmower man stuff or something like that? Like, like what if he actually physically had to cover them with skin? You know, I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. It's just a, it's a way to think about it. So these bodies came from somewhere and they weren't the same bodies that they had before the fall. So I believe they were spirit creatures, you know, and I'll do a whole like drawing on this so you can see it. But, you know, you have three parts of the man, the spirit, the soul and the body. So you have three parts of the man, the spirit, the soul and the body. And it's believed that. You are a spirit who has a soul. That's your emotions, your will, your thought processes. The spirit is just the life form. It's like the electrical light. You know, I can put light in this lamp. I can put light up here, this light that's coming forward for me. And it's all the same electrical force. The only thing that makes it different is the body that it's in. Then you have the soul, which is the personality, the will. You know, I may say, yes, let's go out. And someone else may say, no, I don't want to. That's the soul. That's the difference between us. We each have different motivations. I may want to be rich and you may want to be powerful. Whatever it is, our soul controls how we go about making choices in our life. And then there's the body. And we, each, you know, have our own different looking bodies. And that's pretty cool. But I believe that it used to be. The opposite, the body lived inside. So you had the body, the spirit, and then the soul on the outside. And you could actually see what other people's intentions were because their soul was on the outside. And the spirit insulated the body from being influenced by the soul. Because now our soul influences what our body does. You know, without having the spirit to insulate between the 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 mess you come up with in your mind and then using your body to carry it out like some of us would be worse than animals i mean some of us are some of us our spirit man just completely did just don't even it doesn't even consult with the soul about what the body should do like i said and then some people soul ain't intact 
Some people sold contracts up. We have to return to the way we were created to live. And we were created to live in a space where our body, our gender didn't determine our value and our worthiness. We were able to rest in the garden in the cool of the day and walk with God. You know, Enoch walked with God, you know, and this new version of the Bible, listen, the words we got in the Bible, they're over, they're done. I know it sounds heretical to say that, but he said, lo, I will be with you even until the end of the age. Well, baby, the age ended December, 2020. We're living in a new age, a new, a whole new epistle. And this one is going to be written with women, <laughs> with your Deborahs and your Esthers and your Ruths, with your Rahabs and your Marys. Like we are going to be the ones. And so we're going to have to learn how to rest and worship, how to rest and work, how to work and worship. We're going to have to learn how to be spiritual beings that are just inhabiting these bodies. And we have to keep our lamps full of oil. We have to what? Learn how to sleep standing up. You know, it's easy. If you, if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. Okay. Everything I say, I say it out of love. And if you feel the love, if you feel where I'm coming from, if you're ready to shake off that dust, if you're ready to shrug your shoulders, if you are ready to be <laughs> unplugged, unbothered, and unleashed, go ahead and drop that fire headphones emoji in the comments. Because as always, I am your girl, Debbie and Nikki, your neighborhood wireless woman. I look forward to meeting you down in the comments until the next episode. Class is now dismissed.